The Iditarod Trail. You've heard of it. There's a dog race. Goes to Nome. You know, Balto. It's a great story for sure. But there's more to the Iditarod Trail than the serum run of 1925, which didn't actually follow the trail, and the Iditarod Dog Race, which doesn't run the whole route. So why was a winter trail from Seward to the interior of Alaska needed? And how did this rugged and frankly treacherous stretch of trail become a vital supply route for what would become the last great gold rush? Up north, there may have been as many reasons as there were people, but what drew them all to Alaska was gold. Multiple stampedes drew prospectors by the thousands to Alaska's coasts and further north, ending up on the beaches of Nome. By 1905, the flood of miners and strikes made getting all that gold out a top priority. But let's rewind a bit and get back to Crow Pass in South Central. This entire region is Denina home. Denina Eshknena. Since time immemorial, Denina have built their culture all over South Central Alaska after migrating from lands west of the Alaska Range about 1,500 years ago. Denina were unique from inland Athabascans by having fully adapted to coastal living and would regularly travel throughout Tikatnu by boat. If you were a trader and you were headed from Tutla to Aklutna, a village still there today, you could transport much more over the water than by any other means until the railroad. Gold and steel would change everything in South Central Alaska. Once Seward became a port of choice for the route, it was clear the rail was headed this way. By 1912, the effort had gone bankrupt once, stalled, was restarted, and was on the brink of collapse again, leaving it to the feds to buy out the beleaguered railway and renew efforts to the interior. In the meantime, Thousands of people in the remote north were largely cut off from the rest of the world during winter months, of which there are many. In 1908, the newly formed Alaska Road Commission sent Colonel Walter Goodwin to scout a winter trail between Nome and the ice free port in Seward. Heading north from the end of Steel, and even a short wagon trail, the known Crow Pass route was an obvious choice, but not an easy one. Steep inclines and heavy snowfall made avalanches a constant concern. Still, Winter supply runs would commonly use the route for years, becoming the official route for mail deliveries. Either by foot or by dog sled, crossing the pass during the winter was fraught with hazards. For instance, Belmore Brown, whose experience traveling on the Iditarod was characteristic of the time. After reaching the end of steel near Kern Creek, Brown's party chartered a boat which was quickly swept out of the arm and was nearly logged in ice, forcing them back to Glacier Creek with only one way forward. The important question now is getting a dog team to haul our possessions to Susitna Station. I began to gather a dog team, but my efforts were stopped by joyful news. Bob Griffith and Mitchell, with their two splendid teams, were approaching on their way back to the Iditarod. On the appointed day, Griffith arrived, and after throwing our freight onto his big sleds, we began to climb the Crow Pass. The railroad was now a thing of the past as we followed a regular wood trail that wound steeply upwards through the thick groves of Alaska spruce. At last, on the ragged edge of the timber line, we came to rest before a snow-covered cabin. This was Sam Kappa's roadhouse, and it stood at the mouth of the icy valley that led steeply to the pass. After manhandling the sleds over snow-covered avalanche debris in the valley bed, we at last came to the snow-filled theater under the wall of the pass. 600 feet it rose above us. It rose above us so straight that all we could do was stand in our shoe racks. It's here we began to sweat, said the game warden. The dogs may be able to pull empty sleds, but no loaded sleds have crossed the pass this year. But Griffith was studying the slope and made no move to unhitch the dogs. Then, turning to the second sled, he said, what do you think, Mitchell? And Mitchell answered, let's take a chance. And we did. During the rest, we gasped for breath, and the panting of men and dogs filled the air. When our breathing had returned to normal, Griffith would shout, Mush! Sixty-eight feet would tear madly in the snow, and the sled would lurch upward to an accompaniment of gasps and flying snow. In this way, with our tendons cracking in the mad rushes, we won the top. 
Noon found us eating a light lunch on the top of the pass, shivering in the icy wind. According to Professor Parker's barometer, we were 3,500 feet above Turnigan Arm. Around us rose a desolation of mountain peaks, the home of the white sheep and goat. The descent was no less arduous, with the team cutting trenches down the valley towards the Raven Creek Roadhouse. Despite these risks, for a few short years the trail was busy with couriers, carrying supplies, mail, medicine, and passengers. But around 1916, the existing Indian Pass Trail overtook Crow Pass in popularity as a longer, but less avalanche-prone traverse. And by 1918, the railroad line finally reached the newborn town of Anchorage, bypassing Girdwood and Crow Pass altogether. Soon after, the roadhouses shut down, and the trail fell into disrepair over the next decades. Down in Crow Creek Valley, gold mining would continue to make its mark. The Crow Creek mine, which you can still visit today, was a placer mining claim, which was followed up to load veins of gold which tangled through the mountains. Getting at this gold required more equipment than just a shovel and a pan. Mining at an industrial scale was risky, requiring heavy equipment and steep investments to make your return. Load mining is an arduous, labor-heavy process involving multiple steps which we won't get into too deeply. Downstream, as the Crow Creek mine began to grow on scale, they would utilize a hydraulic giant to move earth, which is less exciting than it sounds, but still pretty cool. A pile of sediment, which is known to have gold in it, is blasted away with a big hose and into a slew system, which allows the gold to be isolated from the surrounding dirt. You can still plainly see where the operation has removed the material. Although the mines managed to extract enough gold to keep operating until 1938, by the time the U.S. entered World War II, even the most profitable mining operations would have to be put on hold until after the war. Most never returned to operation. All the buildings are long gone, but you can still spy some parts of what looks to be the old ball mill from Monarch Mine in the Middle Valley, just off a spur from the main path. If you do visit, be sure to leave any artifacts you find in place. Be advised, since this was a mine, it's probably a bad idea to get your water downstream. For decades along Crow Pass, the mine, roadhouses, and original trail would erode. Even in its ruined state, the trail would continue to pull people across the pass. What drew them all here was Alaska. Way back in 1907, the first leg of this trail, just past the pass, was designated as Chugach National Forest. In 1970, this whole bit would be preserved as part of Chugach State Park. In 1973, the first Iditarod sled dog race was run from Anchorage to Nome, thanks to the monumental efforts of Joe Reddington Sr., helping to rejuvenate dog mushing as a sport. And that just might be why you've heard of the Iditarod Trail. Between 1974 and 1975, 36 young women from Senior Girl Scout Troop 81 started the project to reopen the Crow Pass section of the Iditarod Trail. Guided by park rangers Doug Fessler and Mike Roddick, the scouts worked for six weeks on the trail. With helicopter support from the Army National Guard and construction support from Detachment 1613 Reserve Naval Mobile Construction Battalion, the Girl Scouts worked to reroute the trail to reduce the avalanche hazard and built bridges across some of the streams. In 1978, the Iditarod National Historic Trail is established by Congress, following Walter Goodwin's route over Crow Pass. Over generations, the Crow Pass section of the Iditarod Trail has become the classic hike through the Chugach, earning a place on almost everyone's list and distinction among legendary Alaskan treks. Out here on the trail, you're walking through time, on a route that stretches 1,000 miles to Nome and over 100 years into the past. Even now, most of those miles still lay untamed, but some places, this place for sure could never be. You might not make it all the way to Nome, but these miles can change you as much as they changed Alaska. Most of the gold might be gone, but today, this place is busier than it's ever been. And just like that, it's not only Alaska's history, it's your history. <laughs>